to people. Um, and it's very important to go on the internet and see what else has been done in this area because the last thing you want to do is to build something that's already on the market. You know, that's a big waste of time. Uh, but you want to see what's on the market and see why it isn't the best solution, why this still may be a problem. You want to brainstorm a lot of design concepts. Uh, you want to select a few to uh, start fabricating, uh, testing, evaluating, and uh, repeating the process. You know, the, the, it goes from like it's in your head first, then it's a sketch, and then you make it into a low resolution prototype. And the quicker you go through that process, the more of your brain that you're engaging. You know, uh, uh, a concept in your head is one thing. Having it, seeing it on a page is a totally different thing. But having it in three dimensions where you can turn it over and touch it and stuff like that really engages a lot more of your brain. So that's why you need to do that. And of course, um, you're going to be um, reporting um, your results and presenting them in class. Okay? So the process does not include building what other people tell you to build because you don't, because you're supposed to be creative students. And if you just build what other people tell you to build, that's not being creative. And you don't want to make incremental improvements on stuff that's already out there. That's, that's no good either. You want to be able to, you want to use all the resources uh, that we talked about, the PRL, all the people, the TAs, me, and websites, the internet, and stuff like that. And it's up to you to make your own decisions. Um, because that's what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life. And so this is a good time to start. And you have to justify every decision that you make. So you know, during your presentation, you're going to have to say, somebody might ask you, well, why did you choose that concept rather than this other one? So be prepared to make, defend yourself. Uh, lab notebooks, I don't require lab notebooks. Other courses do. If you feel you need more practice in doing lab notebooks, you're certainly welcome to use them. But I'm not going to, I don't want to look at them. You may want to create a little bit of a diary for um, what you're feeling as you're going through the process um, because you're going to write a reflection at the end. Um, it's, you really need to take pictures of what you're doing. And why, the, the, why do you need to do that? Because p pictures take up space in your report that you would normally have writing in. And I'm sure you'd rather have a picture of the appropriate size than, than write it out. And it certainly makes a lot more descriptive sense to have a photo in there, you know, with arrows pointing to the relevant parts. Um, I want you to really illustrate, you know, what you've done. I want you to keep all your prototypes, show all those, because those, those are, show important progress through, the, through this uh, design uh, process. So I want to ask you one question now. What is your most precious resource, do you think? This is, time is your most precious resource. You can't get more of it. Okay, so make excellent use of your time. Um, you only actually only have seven weeks left to the end, end of the, uh, the quarter, so it goes very fast. So you need to start quickly and maintain that effort. So for people working on team projects, you know, you get to do your first midterm presentation in four weeks, and that goes very fast. So, you know, um, use your time uh, diligently. So the uh, uh, the web pages have <clears throat> not only um, links on there and uh, the slides, but also audio, I mean, also video, and that's working out pretty well this year. So um, if you've forgotten what I said, you can go back and review the video of, of me or the guest lectures. So it's time to, to start going over to PRL, getting your safety, um, safety orientation, paying for your PRL pass, don't wait to do that. Don't wait until for three weeks to do that. I encourage everybody who's working on a team project who's going to be using the PRL to sign up for a pass because you're all going to learn something by being there, even if somebody else is a little bit more um, um, experienced in, in fabricating things. You want to be there and find out how, you know, what's going on. It's going to be a, a great experience. So last, <coughs> last few things. It takes me a while to remember everybody's name, so please don't get upset if I keep on asking you for your, for your name because you know, I'm, I don't have the memory I used to. Again, I'm on your side. I want you to do as well as you, as you can. It's important for you to engage with the class and talk to me. The more you do that, um, you're going to get a better grade. 
can't, it can't hurt talking to me. I'm a nice person, and I have chocolate chip cookies. You know, why wouldn't you want to do that? Okay. Okay. So um, here are some of the projects that have uh, already been um, selected and formed. So for each of these projects, I want to have somebody from the team tell me why they chose that project. So uh, Far East en um, Entertainment. Go ahead. You know, there's a lot of people, you know, um, out there working on this. In fact, I just saw an article today working with muster, uh, muscular dystrophy, and I'll send, send that to you. So, Dukes of Hazard. Yeah. Um, what interested us in the uh, project initially is first of all, a uh, product that we could uh, develop ourselves in. It's kind of a physical product, and not one that we have to do a whole lot of coding around because uh, we have two mechanical engineers and two bio-mechanical engineers. So, this bit really Okay. Good. It sounds like you're excited too. Triple J. Yeah. No team name, uh, Marshall and Susan. You need to come up with a name. Are you looking for a third person on your team or not? Okay. Well, if you want a job, you know, <laughs> check them out. Okay. Disability heroes. Vincent. Okay, there you are. Uh, so yeah, I just chose this because uh, it's something that's closer to home for me, and so uh, it's a way to get more involved in it. Uh, it's more personal, so it makes it uh, easier to devote more of my time to it. Okay, so you have because it's you're dealing with a family member, you might have more incentive to work yeah. on. Okay, that's good. Excellent. So um, somebody asked me about um, the composition of the course, and so I've come up with some numbers from the last, last five years. Um, so last year we had a lot of students, and this year we have about like uh, 32 or 33, so but that's, gonna, that's the ideal number. And here's the breakdown as far as people taking it for credit, no credit, and, and the letter grade. So one last thing. So we've heard a lot of slogans on TV about black lives matter, and then they were shouting yesterday, everybody's life matters, okay? And that includes people with disabilities and older adults, because everybody has something to contribute. Okay, so keep that in mind. So on Thursday, uh, Debbie Kenny is gonna be talking. Uh, as you remember, she had a presentation about a project, about a bunch of projects for, um, um, for daily activities. And uh, she's going to bring a couple of, um, of folks who have had a stroke and interview them and bring a bunch of um, devices to show off. 
So, uh, but today we're going to have Gail Curtis, and he's a long, wait, he's a long time uh, friend of mine and colleague of mine from the VA. How long ago did, did, did you start at the VA? Do you remember? It was 80, some, 80 something, right? Yeah. So I've known Gail for a long time. And Gail is a design consultant in, in the area, specializing in user interface architecture and design strategy for online ventures and interactive products. Um, he was a principal interaction designer at Yahoo, where he developed uh, practice area and strategic ideation and disseminated through workshops, uh, both here and in Asia. And at Stanford, he's taught courses in human computer interfaces and product design. And Gail is, a, is a, actually a product uh, graduate of the product design program here at Stanford. So before we bring uh, Gail up, we're going to have a little bit of a break to switch over. And for people who haven't signed uh, in yet, now is your chance to come down and sign in. And if you need an extra cookie, you can come down and do that. OK, so three minutes. I can, I can sign in for you, uh, Dan, if you want. You got it. That's what the lights are for. Okay. Did you happen to watch the um, 60 Minutes? About, yeah, about the guy. The guy flying. Yeah. Yeah. Moving these, okay, so I can have a clear. Okay. A few people are coming in from the break. Okay, I want to thank Dave for putting me on the spot here. And uh, it's great to see everybody here, and I love the, the projects that you've picked out. Actually, I think it was a great list, especially the, um, what was the one about we're the pre-dead? Oh, yes, yes. I mean, it's sort of interesting perspective to have upon what we're doing here is this is, we're in a pre-death state, and we should think about what are we going to do after that. So um, as Dave mentioned, I came out of the graduate uh, product design program here many years ago. And then I worked over at the VA in the rehab R&D center as a biomedical engineer there for several years. And uh, then I worked in the web development business in San Francisco and around here doing mostly interaction design, information architecture, and, and like that. And uh, most recently, I was working at Yahoo in uh, interaction design there. And people kept coming to ask me, they say, I hear you know something about brainstorming. Can you come and lead a brainstorming session for our new product release? And I said, well, why not? Let's, why don't I, let's run a course, and then you know you can learn you know, how to do it yourself. Because people, they hear brainstorming, they think, bingo, 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 bingo. And that's kind of as far as it goes. And um, what I found was some of them became, a few became good brainstorming facilitators. But 
what was more interesting was that more of them enjoyed and became more productive kind of just doing brainstorming themselves. And uh, so similarly, part of kind of tuning into that part of the design process was learning about need finding and tuning into needs. Because a big part of what kind of goes on here at Stanford in the Stanford Design Program and also in the D School is, you know, if you've seen the D School diagram with the little hexagonal tiles showing the design thinking process, the first one is empathy. The first one is kind of understanding the people and the situation that you're dealing with. And so that's... Um, that's what I want to talk about today as, as kind of a way of where do, you, where do we start? You know, we have all these great project ideas. I love the thing about the guy that wanted something to slip over his leg that it would look sort of normal. And uh, I love the musical instrument ideas the, from Karma. And, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to think about, let's jump in and think and would love to build this great gadget. And so the whole idea, the, the main point of view that I want to start with here is that, you know, it's great to have that enthusiasm, but then we want to keep three things in mind first. One is, things don't have needs, people do. I mean, we, we're in the habit of saying, you know, my car needs some gas. Or, you know, this device needs to do this or do that. You know, we sort of anthropomorphize our gadgets. and it actually can be very helpful and can help us move along to think about that this thing has some intelligence and some sentience and we want to help the product be what it wants to be. But really, especially here, it's really important to think about that we're, we're thinking about the people. And in particular, you know, we're thinking about the pe people that have needs that are kind of different from what we may personally experience. And so we want to look at both kind of like who are the people? Who are the people in the problem space and what are they, what do they say? What are their needs around the problem? So one thing to think about is that, you know, the, the product or the device has, you know, we're thinking about, well, here's a user for this. You're thinking about your, is it your grandmother? So, th so that's, Pretty simple. There's, here's one person that she has a need and I can think about addressing that need. But most other devices, you know, they're going to have, somebody's got to build it, somebody's going to, if it's going to be a product, somebody's going to have to sell it, somebody's going to have to maintain it. There may be caregivers that work on it. So there are all these, there's so, sort of like often a whole network of people that are in the problem, around the problem space. and. Each one of them has sort of a need. You know, you want to try to understand, well, what does this product manager need to see for this product to be a success for him? Which is kind of different from the way that actual user is thinking about what are they trying to, what are they trying to do? What, is the, what does the builder need? How, what is the builder dealing with when trying to do that? So that's the first thing, to sort of think about what are, the, what are all the people that are in the problem? And this is a good exercise in the beginning when you start, you know, you're focusing on here's this person that told the story about what they want. But it's a good exercise for you to then to start thinking about, well, who are all the other people that are related to the problem? Then the second one is define the need in experience terms. Like it's easy to say, my grandmother needs a bottle opener. But then you're sort of defining the need in terms of a gadget. So step back a little bit and just say, my, my, my grandmother needs to get the pickles open. Or even going further back, my grandmother wants pickles. How can I get pickles on her plate? For example, right? And not to minimize the needs of your grandmother, but, you know, the horseback riding project, very interesting. You know, it's not about the horses, or, but it's about, well, the exercise. But then it's about the, the muscular development and the therapy. So how do you kind of like dig back further from the device or a gadget or whatever and to think about what is the experience that 
that person is is wanting, and it kind of in the same and in the same way, if you've identified these three or four or five people in the network of the problem, look back behind them. What is that? manufacturer, that builder, the guy that's going to build it, want? What does that caregiver need? What is their experience? They want to have the experience of having their client be happy or safe or out of distress or something like that. So think about the, use the experience of the person and think about all the people that are in the picture. And then you, you want to look at what's your goal, your target, you know, what, is it, what does it look like when the need is satisfied? What is it like when she has the pickles on her plate? You know, what is her experience? She's, she's happy, she's delighted. Then you realize, well, the really thing is, if I could just materialize pickles on the plate and she would be so delighted to have them there, you know, let's think about that and then let the gadget kind of like take its own shape. So these are uh, kind of three things to think about needs. And these are, you know, this is like a perspective, what I've seen that we need, that we as the designers need to come back to kind of again and again. We'll come up with something and it says, but yeah, but what is the, what is the experience of really if, they've, if we've done this or like that? You know, you want to do it in the beginning, but then, you know, as you're going through and evaluating your own design alternatives and evaluating what you learn, you want to have, step back and take, what, do we do, what is the experience that's being delivered to the person here? And is it really kind of making them happy? So as we dig in and talk to people, so how do we find out about these needs? So we, we sort of boil it down to two things, interview and observation. Talk to people and look at what they do. Look at what happens. When, when the, uh, you know, in the context. And so the first thing we want to try to understand when in the process of doing that is try to understand what does the person want to get or do or have? And here, you know, you start with whatever they say. What do they say? I want, you don't, don't, don't worry about whether it's really a want or a need. You know, this would be kind of like the basic, you know, project requirement statement. You know, you start with that. What are they trying to do? And with respect to what I was just saying, you know, then you want to kind of think about, okay, behind that, what's the sort of experience that they're looking for behind that? Then the second thing, kind of complementary that, what's important about the way they get that? What, is she, what does she want? She wants pickles on her plate, but what's important about, does he want, wants him to be to come there fast, they want to be tasty, they want to be warm. What does it mean for her to have pickles on her plate? The meaning of the thing. So these two things, their goals and their, their values around reaching the goal, again, these, these often show up, I was looking in the project descriptions as, you know, kind of like product requirements, right? They'll be talking about certain attributes must be safe, must look stylish, must, uh, you know, be economical. So these are all kind of like values around the goal of, you know, having, uh, having the experience of horseback riding in your house. Then if we look at the, at the other side, which is sort of like, the first two are sort of like, these are things that are kind of like, you, you find out within the person, then often we look, outside, what are the capabilities, what, what's, what's the stuff that's available in their environment or even in their own capability that they can use to meet that, um, meet those needs. The sort of basic concept, it's kind of a yin-yang thing of, yin, of need and capability. And when, they, when the two kind of like come together, then we have the experience of satisfaction. There's a kind of like a, a notion in, the, in the, the study of innovation that a lot of you know a lot of innovation comes that here's a need that that's here and some new capability you know is developed some new technology is developed to, to better meet that need but there's from another angle we see that it's not a matter of developing the technology it's a matter of having a better understanding of the need well what is really you know what is really going on in the person that we can satisfy in a different way 
So the last thing is to think about uh, the constraints. Okay, what are the blockers or limitations or uh, impediments that the person faces, whether it's their own, you know, in, in, the, in the, uh, the scope of their own ability, maybe there'll be some physical or cognitive uh, disability, but also maybe something in their environment that's, that's, uh, that, they're, that, that effectively makes a limitation on them reaching their goal, satisfying their need. So these are all things that we, you know, in the kind of need finding process, we want to understand these things. And like I say, looking over the project descriptions, a lot of them are, are stated there. But most of them I looked at, okay, this is a good start. And, you know, when you're starting on your project, this, you know, it gives you some idea. This is, think about these things when you start, want to start digging and going back and talking to the person again. But what about, what's really, you know, is there some other way we could do this? Or how do you work around that problem? Or what other kinds of limitations are there? Why can't you just run up this hill or whatever? You know, you, you have to find a way to kind of figure out what are, what are the limitations that they're dealing with here. Once you kind of sort of create a little map of these things, then this becomes a way of guiding yourself through the design process. Because this, this gives you a way to start thinking about, then you, as you start thinking about solutions, you can um, test them against this kind of a framework. So how do we find out this stuff? So as I said just a minute ago, we have the ways of learning. One is we interview, we talk to people. And this is no surprise. I mean, every, everything here is we talk, to, we talk to people all the time. But now, going back, when we're talking to people, this, these are the things that we want to learn. What are, you, what are your goals? What are your values around reaching those goals? What are the capabilities that are at work in this problem space? You're trying to reach your goals. What are the constraints? against you. And you will find, most likely, that it's very difficult if you sit down with a person and say, what are your goals? Now, tell me your values. Now, what are your capabilities? It, this won't work well. So part of the skill, you know, of, of kind of feeling your way and finding your way, is find a way to talk to people to kind of uncover these. And one way to do that which we will do in, in an exercise in a moment, is to, to get people to tell a story ab around the problem that they're dealing with. Get them to tell a story and you can ask questions about their story. That's one thing. And the second is to have, you know, it doesn't have to be the whole team, but it's useful if there are two people talking to the person. Because if you're talking to someone, then you'll kind of run out of something to say, but then the other person can jump in and sort of keep a flow going. I mean, this is just a simple idea, but this is part, part of the thing that where, as engineers, we say, why can't they just tell me what their goals are? <laughs> why can't they just tell me what's important to them? Well, then we put on the hat of our, you know, our, our just being human beings. We're social human beings. We learn, well, we, have to, we, have to, we want to be nice. We want to give ways to to respect them and acknowledge them. And the thing that goes the longest way is, like I was saying, just respect the person, listen to their story, be, really be listening to them and not see them as a way to just meet your need. Your need is you got to do this project, right? Give me that information so I can do my project. So probably you won't get so far that way. And if you turn it around, you say, you know, I'm really interested in what's going on here. How can we, how can we work together to understand what's going here and find some alternative solutions for that. Second is, of course, observation, which is you just watch people. Watch people and in situations. So we're already talking about people in context. So this is why the title here, Need Finding and Context Discovery. So you say, 
the grandmother does it, wants to get the pickles open. Well, watch what, what does she do now? What you know? How does she just kind of make a note of what? Well, she goes here, she does this, and she does that, and or she calls up somebody. Can you come open up these pickles, right? Whatever, just find out what's happening now, because this will give you some insight into, you know, what are the capabilities and resource. What you know, what's actually be people are using now. This is you know, because actually we're, we're sort of getting a picture of. As engineers, we understand forces, right? Think of the forces acting on the problem. So there's a network of people that are working around the problem, and there are forces acting on the problem. The forces are the capabilities that are enabling things to happen. The constraints are blockages that are preventing things from happening. The need is there that's driving everything toward a solution. So you're thinking about that. You, you want to try to understand that by walking it. Then the uh, Dave was talking about you know build, building something. You know you want a, a good way to, to learn is to build something. Build something and take it to the person. What do you think about this? Try this. You can start with a sketch, and that's a good way to sketch, sketch because you can do that in 20 minutes, right? You can brainstorm. Thing. Well, let's go show her this thing and see what she what she says. You will learn something. Every time you show the user something, you will actually learn something more. And the more you can show them, the more they can learn. And let it be unfinished. Let it be a crude mock-up. Because if it looks too finished and all painted and all that, they'll be shy. They won't want to say, oh, it looks fine. You know, they, they'll be shy about uh, tearing it apart. You want them to tear it apart. You want to find out, yeah, this is why it's not working. So once you kind of learn something, we think we've learned everything, but then we want to, and uh, <clears throat> this is an idea from uh, Michael Berry, who teaches the need finding class here in the design program. He says, you know, we got design thinking going, we got that down cold, but you know, sometimes what we really need is critical thinking. You will hear kinds of things, you will see all kinds of things, and you want to say, okay, what are the facts of the situation that I saw? What are the assumptions that I'm making about the facts? You know, I saw my grandmother do this. Okay, that's fine. Well, I, I, and, and, well, she must just not have the strength to open it up. Or it must just be too high on the shelf or something like that. Well, those are assumptions we made. It's not bad to make those assumptions. I mean, we, have to, we couldn't, you know, drive across town with making assumptions. But we want to be, identify, okay, this is an assumption. So how can we learn what the facts are? And then we make inferences about it. So it's really just being able to come to a clear understanding of what, what, are, what are the facts we're dealing with and, and what is the things that maybe we need to learn more about the facts. Then of course, then the design thinking component, this is all about the empathy node. So then we're going to ideate, that is brainstorm, explore all kind of alternative ideas, sketch, make some prototypes and iterate. So this process will go on until the end of the class and you have to stop, right? Your final presentation, then you have to stop. And then sometimes even we say, well, let me go up and clean that up before I turn it in. So um, that's what we do. So interviewing, some simple tips is uh, try to avoid asking leading questions. It says, Grandma, you didn't like to, you don't like to hold that you know, pickle jar that way, do you? Well, no, ask. Show me what happens. Show me what you're trying to do when, you're, when you want to get the pickles open. Second, ask them to show as well as tell, right? Because then you know, you're going to be talking to them. So the, the pluses of doing the interviewing is we get the information directly from them. And uh, it takes a lot of time, though. And it's, too, it's very easy. To, we see one little thing happen, and we want to generalize that to the whole thing. And also, people say one thing, but actually, they do something different. So this kind of goes back is, you know, well, when you say, well, you can, can you show me what happens? Or can you point on here how you actually get that? Because they will actually, 
you know, without thinking. We think we're doing one thing, but when somebody observes, something else is actually happening. The, the observation is that, you know, the good thing we, we actually get to observe the actual activity. We want to find, you know, the actual situation where some, that someone is in. You know, it's one thing to have someone come in here and we talk to them. You know, we really want to go talk to, like, um, who was it that wants to pimp her wheelchair? It's Aubrey. Aubrey, yeah, Aubrey. You know, must be willing to go to Google and see, like, the world that she lives in and see how that feels. So we want to, you know, basically shadow something. So this is actually, almost everybody is doing something that it would be worth, de you know, dedicating a session that somebody goes and just follows somebody around as they're going through the thing. It's useful if everybody in the team does it, but sometimes just this is kind of like a team resource management issue. Sometimes you know only one or two people can do that while somebody else is actually prototyping something. So this is the kind of thing where you have to kind of you know divide up the uh, activity and. The main thing about observation is the same thing. Look at what are the resources. Look at what are people are using to actually get the thing done. And what are the obstacles that come in the way. This comes back to capabilities and constraints. Okay. Perfect. So that's actually great. Thank you for mentioning that because it's sort of like you know we think we're going to think about the people that are the people in the problem, the network of the problem, and somehow to what, what can we learn from the other the other key people in the problem? That's good. So we like to do a little exercise here, and we'll you know this would be like a little ten minute thing to just sort of get feet wet in in um, interviewing. And the idea is, and I see a lot of you are sitting with your team. So let's say, you know, put one team maybe against another team or something. Don't just talk to people in your team. So the idea is two to four people, just to keep it simple, you know, somebody that's sitting around you. One person volunteers to be the interviewee. And if it's someone uh, with who is one of the uh, project, someone who has a project, someone from the community, someone with a disability that happens to be here, that's great. But if, if there's nobody sitting around next to you, you know, it's more important right now, we're just going to jump in and, and do this little interview exercise. And that the subject of the interview is how do you start your day? This is, a, this is an experience everybody deals with, but once you start talking to people, you find that there's, it's kind of all over the map. So the idea, you know, if one person volunteers, okay, I will tell my story. And the rest of you, two or three or four people, uh, see what you can find, see what you can learn. And again, we're back to goals, values, capabilities and constraints and and, you're, and then we're trying to learn what do the, what do people do well I get out of bed I get some coffee and I get dressed well go for, dig deeper okay that there's what are the activities what are the, what is the stuff that gets used well there's coffee and there's soap in the shower and like that and then, then there's gear there's I just called it gear but there's some kind of artifacts are used, right? You're making coffee, you got, you got a coffee maker, you got a cup or something. What are all, try to understand, like, get, get, the, get the whole picture of what's, what, is, what, what is all involved with do that. And actually, I didn't mention here, are there other people involved? Does somebody come in and wake you up? Is someone else bringing you the coffee? Are you getting coffee for someone else? So this is a simple story, and we want to, I would like to just keep it simple because we don't have a whole lot of time. But just to sort of practice hearing someone's story and then asking questions that 
lets you amplify on these kind of like these four sectors of information that you want to get out of it. And any questions? Yeah. Uh, just in, in case any uh, groups kind of would, would particularly want to interview someone from the disability community, uh, uh, one of those is the. Uh, well, I thank you. Would you like to uh, raise the hands? For yeah. If anyone from the disability community would like to. Okay. So there you go. And I would like to suggest. Um, these would be great people to talk to. And again, to keep the logistics of getting these teams together, you know, I think mainly so it's kind of like just turn around and see who's in front of you, behind you, find a way that, that four people can start talking together. And you guys are in the back, they're all on one team. Don't just talk to yourselves. Talk to somebody on another team, okay? So we'll do this for, we'll just do this for 10 minutes, all right?